Good morning, church. I think my mic's on this service. Appreciate Paul and the celebration team leading us this morning in worship. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael. I'm the children and student pastor here. And it's an honor to be able to uh, teach the Lord's word this morning for us and to gather together uh, for graduation Sunday. Some of my graduates have spread into the group, so I'm going to have to look around even more. Uh, but graduation Sunday, we're so excited for all the Lord is doing in our graduates and through them. We know that they're, they have new adventures ahead and even some challenges, but we know also uh, that the Lord's with them, and we're thankful for the Lord's blessing in their lives. They have uh, so many accomplishments and achievements over the past several years, and they've been blessed with so much. All these blessings and all these gifts uh, are wonderful, but we know that the greatest gift that we've been given as believers is the gospel, that we've been given Jesus. And this idea of being given the gospel, being given the message of Jesus, comes along with it, the idea of being entrusted, that the Lord has given us the gospel that we would go and tell others about him. Every believer has been entrusted with the gospel, and every day he sends us out into our neighborhoods and our communities to be on mission to tell others about Jesus. And while graduates, y'all have achieved so much and had many accomplishments and even great successes these past several years, what's of greatest value we know from the scriptures is our faithfulness to the Lord. So the question for us this morning, not just for the graduates, but for all of us, is how do we remain faithful to God? How do we remain faithful to the Lord? And this morning, to answer that question, we're going to look at one of Paul's letters here in 2 Timothy as he writes to Timothy and encourages him and challenges him as he walks with the Lord to remain faithful in him. But before we read, if you'll join me in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and as we just sang and we just declared that you are Lord of all. You're Lord of our lives and of our decisions. And Father, we are so thankful that you are in control of all things. Father, we thank you for our graduates and for their families, Lord, as they celebrate this time together. And Lord, we thank you most of all for your faithfulness in their lives and in ours. God, I pray this morning as we open up your word, as we read your word, I thank you for giving us your word that you reveal yourself to us. And Father, that you've given us your Holy Spirit to give us understanding and application to your word, that we would live according to it and live in obedience to you. And Father, I pray now that as I speak that my words would be yours. And Father, um, I thank you that even in my emptiness that you can fill me. And even where I'm weak, Father, you are strong. And so I pray, Father, that the power of God would be displayed this morning through the teaching and the preaching of your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll read with me, uh, either in your Bibles or on your phone or up on the screens, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Longing to see you even as I recall your tears so I may be filled with joy. For I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that it is in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Paul comes to the end of his life. He's in prison in Rome. He knows that he's going to be executed. And we see that this is one of his last letters, and he writes it to Timothy, one that he has poured his life into, one that he has... Uh, intentionally uh, mentored and discipled, and he comes here nearing the end of his life, and we see that his concern wasn't, Paul's concern wasn't about himself, but it was about Timothy, and most importantly, about the gospel, that the gospel would go forth, that the gospel would spread, and the kingdom would advance. Paul, here in this text, he encourages Timothy to be faithful 
to rightly guard the gospel and to give the gospel to the next generation. So at the end of Paul's life, what is he most concerned about? The gospel, the good news of Jesus, that other people would know him. And this morning, as we look at what it means to be faithful and how we're to remain faithful, we see three key things in this text about how we can remain faithful. The first is we are reminded that God calls us to be faithful. God calls us to be faithful. Paul starts off the letter just like he did many of his letters by introducing himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus. But in this letter, it's a little bit different. We see that he identifies himself as an apostle, but it's by the will of God. And in this very first sentence, we see Paul's humility and his surrender. That when God calls us, it requires and demands our surrender and our humility. The name Paul is actually his Gentile name. He was named Saul before the encounter on the road to Damascus. And so once he encounters Jesus, uh, he starts and begins using the name Paul. And his Gentile name means a little or little one. And we see his humility here. We see that it call, he identifies himself as an apostle, as a teacher. Um, this is very typical of most of his letters and normally to show the authority of his letter because this letter was written to Timothy, but also to the church uh, that Timothy pastored in Ephesus. And more than likely, most of Paul's letters were circulated among the churches that other believers would receive the same teaching um, to edify and to build up the church. Uh, this was part of his habit, but more so to identify his humility because he identifies that he was made an apostle not of his own desire, not of his own will, but of God's will. The origin of God's apostleship was God himself. Paul's authority and his obedience to the mission came from the Lord. Paul didn't volunteer for it. God called Paul. It wasn't of Paul's own doing, but of God's will. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, uh, we see that he writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me in to the ministry. It wasn't Paul's abilities, it wasn't his strength, it wasn't his wisdom or knowledge or the things that he accomplished, but it was the power and strength of Almighty God. And we see And we see in verse three and others. In verse three and others, as we see God's call in our lives to be faithful, reminded of God's faithfulness in our own. Life, that He was a teacher, but that He had, was a messenger. That He was sent out. That He was commissioned as an ambassador for the gospel. It reflects the urgency of Paul, Paul's call as he shares it with Timothy to remain faithful to God and to God's call to spread and to share the gospel. Uh, over the past several weeks, being in a military community, we have lots of families coming into our community, lots of families leaving because of the military. We've been talking about this with our girls, and they've been asking different questions. Several neighbors of ours um, are moving this summer, and so we've been talking about uh, just the military and how military brings people into our, our neighborhoods and our communities for a time, and then oftentimes several of those families uh, go and so we were talking about that and just saying that the military takes them. And Josie spoke up and goes, no. She goes, God sends them. God's taking them. And it was so true that our five-year-old daughter reminded us that God is the one who sends us and places us where he wants us for his purposes and for his plan. That we are all sent out and we all must be intentional and in recognizing that God has a mission for us to accomplish, to tell people about Jesus wherever we go. Graduates, high school graduates, as you go off to college, you may have uh, identified with a school and chosen to go to a school. I know that many of you, uh, you guys have spent time praying and seeking the Lord's leadership, and y'all are going to get amazing degrees, and God has a great thing in store for you. But he has called you to those schools so you can make him known. College graduates, he's placing you in jobs and career fields so you can build relationships with people to make God known. And we're all sent out, not just our graduates, but us as well, into our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our schools. Paul knew this task of testifying to the gospel was bigger than himself. 
And so when we think about God's call, not only do we realize we need to surrender and be humble, and not only are we sent out, but we also remember that God's our supply, that he supplies us with the ability and the strength to be obedient to tell others about him. We find our source of strength in God himself. God's call is always greater than our ability to obey and to carry out in our own strength. The gospel is Paul's purpose here at the end of verse 1, that he is an apostle by the will of God according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. So how was Paul able to carry out God's mission? According to the promise of Jesus. The gospel does more than just offer life. It promises us life. We are guaranteed life with Jesus that Jesus defeated death by giving his own life that we might receive life. We talk about the difficulty of living in obedience to God, but we have this simple provision by Almighty God for living in obedience to him because he paid the price for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took our place in Romans 15, 4, it talks about the promise. The scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promise to be fulfilled. We've been given God's word. We've been given Jesus Christ who came and lived on this earth, a perfect, sinless life, and died in our place. But as the scripture says, he rose again on the third day. We've been given new life through Jesus, and we've been given God's word, which is the word of life. Paul writes later on in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. The Lord is our supply. He is the one who strengthens us and gives us the ability to follow him. In verse 2, we also see that he supplies us with grace, mercy, and peace. Grace for the undeserving, mercy for the helpless, and peace for the restless. These three things tell us not only about God's great love for us, but also about our great need for God because of our sinful condition. Grace, God's kindness to us, and even though we were undeserving. It's a picture of the gospel, that even though we deserve death because of our sin, Jesus came, he died, he rose again, and if we place our faith in him and we surrender our lives to him, he gives us new life. We don't deserve it. Mercy, God showing mercy to the weak and to the helpless, those who can't help themselves. We hear a lot of times God can only help those who help themselves. And sometimes we think about that. We may even say it or think it ourselves, but it's nowhere in scripture. But God shows us in his word that we're called to help those who can't help themselves, that we were the ones who could not help ourselves, that we were separated from God because of our sin. And Jesus stepped in, God in the flesh, down to this earth and showed us what it means to live in obedience to the Lord and took our place. That God has shown us great mercy. And Paul even writes of this in his first letter, I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And then the peace that the Lord offers, this idea of being reconciled, of being brought back into relationship with God, that what sin has separated, Jesus has been brought back together through his blood. God places his call on our lives, but we also see from this text that he places us in a family. We see here Paul mentioning Timothy's grandmother and mother. We see the godly influence that they had in Timothy's life. And Paul writes of this. He talks about their heritage and their sincere faith. We see Paul using language of beloved son and this passion that exists and this intentionality in their relationship together uh, that Paul saw himself as a father figure in Timothy's life, uh, not because he didn't have godly influence, but because God had called him to invest and to be intentional in Timothy's life. So we see here in the text the, the importance of family as we grow and as we mature in our walk with the Lord, that we need family, but also just God calls us as the church his family, that we are a family of God. And there's intentionality and purpose in that, that we need one another. We need the church. And graduates, 
my prayer, Dana's prayer for y'all, is that you guys would find a church family, that you'd plug in, that you'd be connected, that you'd grow in your walk, that you'd get fed, but you'd also serve inside that church and alongside the church in the community. We see from this passage there's three people that we need in our lives as we're in the family of God. First, we see mentors who love us. Paul says, my beloved son, we see the emotion, the love, the compassion, this idea of family, the bond that took place between Paul and Timothy. Uh, Paul was part of Timothy's conversion when Paul took his first missionary trip to Lystra. Uh, Paul more than likely accepted Christ at that time. This deep bond developed between Paul and Timothy. We see that not only do we need mentors to love us, but we need intercessors to pray for us. I love there in verse three that Paul says, I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, that the Lord would bring to mind Timothy to Paul and that Paul would pray for him. We need prayer warriors in our lives. I think the interesting thing to me is that Paul and Timothy were so different. Timothy was younger, uh, he was inexperienced, he was shy, and uh, he was pastoring a church in Ephesus. And Paul continues to be an encouragement to Timothy as he ministers, as he leads the body of believers in Ephesus. Paul, in contrast, was mature. He was experienced. He was tough. He by no means was young, weak, or shy. But even despite these differences, the Lord brought these two men together, and Paul loved Timothy. And Timothy wasn't who he was because of Paul, but because God and his spirit at work in the life and the heart and the ministry of Timothy. What characterized Paul and Timothy's relationship best wasn't just the love and the prayers, but the encouragement. Paul not only loved Timothy and prayed for him, but Paul believed in him, and Paul thanked Timothy, thanked God for Timothy. So we need mentors who love us, intercessors who pray for us, and encouragers who support us. We see here Timothy's mother and grandmother, we see the sincere faith in them, and as a result, their sincere faith uh, in Timothy, Uh, but we must remember that we don't inherit our parents' faith that can't be passed on, that each person must choose to give their lives to the Lord and to receive him by faith. Later in this letter, Paul writes that Timothy, from the very early childhood, was taught the Old Testament scriptures by his mother and grandmother, and this was great preparation when Paul came to hear and to receive the gospel as Paul preached it. Parents, grandparents, your children don't inherit your faith, but they can be led to faith by your example, your prayers, and your teaching. We have a tremendous responsibility, not just as parents, as grandparents, but as a church body, to invest and to be intentional into the next generation, to teach God's word, to live in obedience, and to live out a sincere faith. Just as the students need to be looking and graduates need to be looking for these people in their lives, we do as well. But as the church, we need to be these people in others' lives, that God has called us to be mentors who love and intercessors who pray and encouragers who support. I've, I thought of uh, two men uh, this week um, who've just been an encouragement to me and a blessing to me and to our church, um, those that wouldn't uh, want recognition, um, but I, I wanna celebrate them and, and their obedience and just the conversations I've had with them. The first is Bob and Guffey. If you don't know Bob, he's Lori Dunn's dad. And I've met with him a couple times over the past couple months and just hearing his heart and how God's working in him and how God's used him at uh, previous churches. Uh, but he is gonna be coming on our children's ministry starting uh, June 3rd in our th- uh, third grade Sunday school class, second hour with Susan Brevoort. And uh, I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful for his love for the word and his desire to see children and students know God's word and to live it out. And the other uh, gentleman, he's also a senior adult, is Freddie Allen. Uh, some of you may know him. He greets on Sunday mornings uh, for both services. And uh, he's just a tremendous, faithful, godly man. And uh, he also has been serving in our children's ministry, not with third grade, not even with three-year-olds, uh, but with two-year-olds. Uh, every other Friday morning when our mops meet, uh, we have women from them throughout the community come and are ministered to by our mentor moms and our uh, child care workers provide child care. Um, he is one of them, he and Claudia Gray, in room number four. Uh, they're on the corner there, the first hallway, and they have anywhere from 12 to 15 two-year-olds that they love on from 9.30 to 11.30 every other Friday morning. 
and they love him. They do not want anyone except for Mr. Freddie and Miss Claudia. And <clears throat> the investment that he's making in loving on them and teaching them God's word and the opportunity that he has, even as the moms drop them off and pick them up uh, to invest and to be intentional, um, they give us, he and Bob, and many of you as well, uh, we have tremendous examples of what it means to be intentional as we invest into the next generation. The greatest influence in our lives is our home and is our family, our parents. Um, but a question I had as well for us is what about those who don't have Christian homes, who don't have Christian parents? And I think the answer that God gives us is us, the church. Those who don't have godly parents, parents that are raising them in godly homes, we are the answer for those children and those students. Our students are so faithful, and even many of our families are so faithful to bring children uh, each week to hear about Jesus, and I'm so thankful for them. Um, there was a girl, the name of Rhonda, and she had a wonderful home, two parents that loved her and two siblings, uh, but they did not go to church anywhere. And so in third grade, she made a new friend at school. Her name was Phyllis, and they became best friends. They did a lot together. And about fourth grade, within a year, uh, Phyllis and her family started inviting Rhonda to, to church with them. They would come to her home, pick her up, take her to church. Afterwards, they would go uh, to Phyllis's grandparents' house, and then they would go out to lunch together. And then late afternoon, they would take her back home. Every week, uh, the Burrell family, Phyllis Burrell and her family, would pick her up. In sixth grade, Rhonda accepted Christ at a youth rally. And this is really close to my heart because that little girl named Rhonda is my mom. And she is the only believer on her, she is the only believer on her side of the family. And it's a reminder for me and for us of the intentionality that we have when we can connect with families and with children, that we can be that spiritual family that they may not have in their home that even though they may not have a godly influence in their home, that we can be the ones to speak truth and life to them. There's this quote by John Stott, a new generation of young Timothys is needed who will guard the sacred deposit of the gospel, who are determined to proclaim it and are prepared to suffer for it, and who will pass it on pure and uncorrupted to the generation which is in due course will rise up to follow them. A new generation of Timothys is needed but church, even more so, a new generation of Pauls is needed. We need to be those Pauls who are intentionally investing and intentionally discipling the next generation. Because you see, this new generation of believers, they may not necessarily be in our church, but they're in our communities, they're in our classrooms, they're in our workplaces, and God sends us out, and so we must go. How important is intentional discipleship to you? Paul writes and he tells Timothy to invest into other men and in the same way that Paul has invested into him. Church, do you have a Paul in your life? Do you have a Timothy in your life? Because we need both. Graduates, you need both. If we were to ask Timothy about Paul, he would no doubt say, Little my Rome, Georgia came out. Whoa. He would, he would undoubtedly say it was Paul's faithful encouragement, his unending prayers, and his unconditional love that strengthened and sustained him to remain faithful in following Jesus. God has a call in our life, and he's given us a family to be a part of and to grow in. And lastly, we see that he has also given us his spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's greatest gift to us, that he lives within us. He's equipped us to use the gifts that God's given us and to do what God has called us to do. He mentions here in verse 7 that God has not given us a spirit of timidity or of fear, but if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with fear and with worry. Our immediate future of unknowns or what-ifs or thinking, I pray that would never happen to me. All these things can keep us up at night. They can paralyze, paralyze us from really living. Over and over again in the Bible, we're told not to fear. Why? Because God is with us. 
He knows our future. Instead of allowing fear to steal our joy, our power, and our love, we must remember the amazing gifts that God has so graciously given each one of us. And here we see it's the gift of power and love and self-control. The next time we struggle with fear, we must remember what we've been given by our Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit's been given to each one of us, to every believer, and not of fear, but of power, love, and discipline. Have you ever sensed God calling you to do something and it seemed way beyond your abilities? Be encouraged by Timothy's life. Do you wanna serve God and obey him, but you're feeling weak or afraid or inadequate? Don't worry, Timothy felt this way too. And if you feel this way, take courage because it's through your weakness that God wants to fill you with the power of his Holy Spirit. We're called to fight fear with God's promises and Paul shares three things, three promises that he gives us through his Holy Spirit. The first is power. Acts 1.8, one of the last things we have recorded of Jesus talking with his disciples, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives us power to share him with others and to serve him and to serve others. In our weakness, the Holy Spirit breathes his strength. We have confidence that he enables us and he equips us with abilities to live for him and to do what he's called us to do. More importantly, to be who he's called us to be. We cannot serve God without the Spirit of God. Not only does he give us power, but he gives us love. And not just any love, not just a feeling, but his love. The same love that he's given us and demonstrated to us, he wants us to love people in the same way to be humble, to be a servant. If you'll turn with me uh, to Philippians chapter two, we see a picture of the love and the humility and the service that Jesus demonstrated for us. Philippians two, verse three through five. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're called to selflessly serve others, to put others' needs before our own, and not to be interested in what we, meet, what we might gain. We must love the people of God, love the people of God, the people of God, the people of God. Lastly, the Holy Spirit gives us discipline. Some translations say self-control, uh, several commentaries uh, that I read said level-headedness. I liked that. Um, but the idea of self-control, being self-disciplined, of restraint, um, of being under control, but more so than us being under control is us being under God's control, that we would allow him to control our thoughts and our actions and our attitudes. Wearsby says that a self-controlled person is a person who is sensibly minded and balanced, who has his life under control. Philip Towner says, Paul has in mind a measure of control over one's thinking and actions that allows a balanced outlook on any situation. When everything's coming unglued, this quality of level-headedness will keep the Christian focused calmly on the power and the love that the Spirit provides, and so it makes perseverance in life and ministry possible. We're called to submit to be under God's authority, to be under his leadership, and living dependent upon him. We fight this fear by depending on the Lord's promise and depending on his presence, that God promises to be with us. His spirit provides the power we need to share Jesus and to be faithful to him. He also provides the love we need to minister and to serve. We must be disciplined and diligent and brave and obedient. Not only is God with us, but his spirit is within us. And that's the greatest gift. Here in verse six, Paul also tells Timothy to fan the flame or to kindle afresh. 
This verb kindle is not to imply that Timothy has let the fire die down and must fan the dying embers into flame, but more so that he's to stir it up, to stir up that inner fire, to keep it alive, and to even keep it blazing, to be faithful, to exercise the gift that God had given him, and to seek him for strength and refreshment. God's giftedness was in Timothy. Timothy didn't need more fire or more flame. Paul believed in Timothy and the Holy Spirit who was empowering him. Timothy didn't need to add anything new to his life. All he had to do was kindle afresh those things that God had already placed in him. And we see the assurance of salvation that Timothy had and that we have as believers, that we don't need to add anything to our lives, but to use what God has already placed in us. Every believer has received a gift of the Spirit. We must exercise it, put it into practice, those gifts that the Lord has given us. Are you using those gifts? Or are you waiting for someone to ask you? We see here in the passage that God calls us to fan into flame those gifts. It requires work, it requires effort, and it most definitely requires intentionality. We step out and obey God no matter how inadequate we may feel, and we do so confidently not in ourselves, but because of God's Spirit working in us who gives us power, love, and discipline. Church, we're to be faithful to God's mission because he has given us his call, his people, he's given us our church family and his spirit. We have no excuse. We've been given everything we need. Every believer has been entrusted with the gospel. Timothy was faithful. And the question for each of us today, not just our graduates, is am I? Am I being faithful to God? Have I accepted his call? Have I recognized God's faithfulness in my life and have I responded to his faithfulness by being faithful as well, realizing I need to surrender my life and be humble before him, that he has sent me out, that he has sent us out, and that we find our supply in him? Have we surrendered ourselves with people to love us, to pray for us, to support us, to encourage us, to challenge us, we have amazing small groups on Sunday morning, Sunday school classes that you can be a part of that connect and you dive into the word and you have opportunities not just to study the word and to know the word, but to discuss the word and to talk about how God's word is impacting your life. We need that. We need mentors. We need intercessors. We need encouragers. And not only that, church, but are we intentionally investing into the next generation? Are we intentionally investing in discipling those who will carry out the gospel for the years to come? It's a huge task. It's a huge calling. But we don't do it on our own, and so are we relying on the Holy Spirit that God's given us? Are we trusting his promises instead of giving in to fear? And are we living in his power, his love, and his self-discipline? As a believer, our greatest success in life will be measured uh, not by all of our achievements, not all of our awards, but by our faithfulness to God. Oswald Chambers said, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or abandonment of reliance on them. All through history, God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of his power and grace. I love that sentence right there. It gives hope for all of us. God has chosen and used nobodies. But the depend, their dependence on him, on the Lord, made it possible to display God's power and God's grace. God chose and used somebodies only when they renounced dependence on their natural abilities and resources. Graduates, y'all have done great things, and we are so excited, and we rejoice and celebrate with you. But our desire and our prayer is that we could continue to rejoice, not in your accomplishments and achievements, but in your obedience to follow the Lord. And we've seen that evidence in these past several years we've walked alongside of you. And we look forward to the great things he's going to do in you and through you. Because faithfulness to God requires humility and surrender that we would submit and depend on him. God's given us everything we need to be faithful in sharing him. He's given us his call. He's given us a church family. And he's given us his spirit. And so wherever God sends us, whether it's to a college, or to a new career, or to a new city, or maybe the military sends you. It truly is God that sends us, and we are called and sent out 
And God calls us to be faithful in following him and making him known. If you'll pray with me. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Father, I thank you for our graduates, Lord, and their families. Lord, how much they mean to us. And God, looking uh, at these past several years, how you've grown them, how you've matured them in their walk with you. And Father, we pray that they would remain faithful to you as you send them out. Lord, they would be ever mindful of the call you've placed on their lives, that they would be humbled. Father, that they would acknowledge uh, your mission as you send them out. Father, they would depend and rely on you, that you are their supply. And Father, that they um, would be part of a church family that would challenge them and encourage them in their walk, that would walk alongside of them and be intentional in their lives. God, may we as a church family be those Pauls to Timothys. May we be intentional in those who are new in their faith or who don't even know you, Father, that we would be sent out, and that we would serve, and that we would share Christ, that we would be a spiritual family to those who don't know you, that you would love them through us, that they would see your love and your grace through our lives, and Father, that they too would give their lives to you, that we could join them and welcome them into your body, to your family. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit, that you haven't called us to a task that we um, can't accomplish. Uh, we can accomplish it on our own, Father, but you have given us your spirit who works in us and through us. And Lord, it's not one of fear, but Lord, it's of power and of love and of discipline. And I pray that our lives would be marked um, by surrendering and being under your authority and your leadership in our lives. And Father, however your spirit is working this morning, I pray that we would respond. And Father, we thank you uh, for our graduates. We thank you for their many accomplishments. And Lord, we pray over them your blessing as they go. And Lord, that they would continue to be found faithful as they follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.